Hope everyone is having a good week. Uh, I hope you hopped on um, to the services Wednesday, the 24th of June, and saw that we are um, uh, going to be having our teen service here in a couple weeks, and um, two Wednesdays um, from this upcoming Wednesday. And so uh, uh, I hope that uh, you watch that service and that got the information that you need for that. Looking forward to that. Once we start having our teen service, once again, we will not be doing these videos anymore. And um, I, I have not necessarily enjoyed making these videos, but I hope that they've been a blessing to help um, to people and, and to our teens especially. And I'm going to spend much time in what we're going to discuss here uh, today and, and uh, studying and preparing for this. And, and I hope that it'll be a blessing and help. That's my goal. That's my aim. I want to be a blessing and help to our teenagers and, um, and as I'm not able to see them as much as I was able to before. Flipping your Bibles to Genesis chapter number one, and, and uh, the times we're living in today are very divisive. They're very um, divided, and, and um, there's a lot of hurt and harm going around. And uh, they're divided politically, racially, economically, culturally. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of division in our country today. And I, I've listened to several videos of people trying to uh, give help about some of the problems we're facing when it comes to uh, racial relations, and, and uh, many of them have been helpful. But one thing that I, I noticed was lacking from some of them that I watched was uh, the truth and hope that we can only find from Scripture. Um, I, I can't give you much truth and hope from my, my personal experiences or my opinions or thoughts on these things, but what I can do is give you some truth and hope from Scripture. And um, our experience cannot bring... Our experiences alone cannot uh, bring truth and hope in a definitive way because experience are personal. Experiences are personal. They're not universal. I won't interpret your experiences the way that you do or you won't interpret the experiences I have the way um, that uh, that I would. Um, and, and I will not feel the emotions that you felt and the experiences that you've had. Um, but what I can say is kind of what Peter said when he talks about his experience with Christ um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. He talks about how incredible it was to, to be there and witness that and that he got to be an eyewitness of, of that, of seeing the glory of God come upon his son there. And he says in Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy that this, this prophecy is more sure than my eyewitness account and my experience. Whereunto we do well that we take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, that the truth and the hope that's found in God's word is not personal. It's universal. It's not something that can only be applied to me and can only be experienced by me and can only, I can only get the, the truth and hope out of it for me. No, no, no. This is something that can be uh, truth and hope for everyone, regardless of who they are, what they've experienced, um, what, what their opinion is. That, that, that it's true. The hope in scripture is universal, but also our opinions. They're fluid and controversial. They're not immutable and transformational. Opinions change. They change a lot. I know mine has. There was a time not all that long ago that I thought that race was not necessarily a problem in America. And opinions changed because the things have come to light that have changed my opinion. And opinions are fluid. They, they, they move about. They change. And um, God's word never changes. It's the same today as it was 2,000 years ago. And it's as timely today and applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago. It never changes. And opinions are controversial uh, based on what someone else thinks and the experience. I could uh, state some of my opinions or you could state some of yours. I mean, I would say, man, it's a controversial statement. That's a controversial opinion. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with that. But God's word is transformational because it is the only place where definitive truth can be found. Today, we're living in a day and age where uh, fake news is a big statement, right? When I was a teenager, um, fake news was not talked about, right? We, we probably all kind of knew that um, news was a biased thing and, and that, that, that the news sometimes maybe skewed the truth in some areas. But um, today, we look at the news and there, everything is is uh, uh, looked at as maybe that might not be true. Maybe this is false. Maybe all of these things happen. Um, I can't remember the name of the reporter, but uh, I remember a reporter... Um, about the time I graduated high school, or maybe when I was in college, I, it was when I was younger and felt like a teenager anyway. And, um, I mean, he talked about this helicopter, 
um, plane crash that he was in. And he wasn't even in the helicopter plane crash. And here he is talking about this. And, and it just, it was fake news. And, um, and so, uh, the only place where we can find definitive truth and find, uh, where truth is that does not change is in God's word. We, we can't find it in the media. We can't find it in, um, a book someone's author. We can't find it in someone's opinion or Facebook post or social media, uh, addressing of an issue. It can only be found in scripture. And we cannot read God's word and say, I don't agree with the viewpoint expressed here. Why? Because it's truth. It's the only thing that is definitively truth. And um, John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Jesus is speaking. Thy word is truth. We must allow God's word to transform our opinions. It's transformational. Uh, because it is truth, we can't look at it and say, well, it doesn't match my opinion, so it's not truth. No, we look at it and say, it doesn't match my opinion, so I must transform my opinion. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse number 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, so understanding that God's word is where we can find truth, let us look... Um, at some things that I can believe can help us and encourage us and give us some hope. I can't give you uh, my experiences of racism because I don't have any. I will not give you my opinions of racism for they don't matter much and they may not agree with your opinions. Opinions uh, I've heard are like armpits. You know, everybody has them, but sometimes they, and most of them stink. I think opinions are a little more like feet. Okay. And here's what I mean by that. They, they only take us down a path. And take us down paths that we're familiar with and comfortable with is where our opinions take us. And then also, they don't look good to most people, right? Feet are, feet are pretty gross. And uh, most people don't like to look at your feet or my feet or, you know, you may think your feet are beautiful, but I probably don't, okay? And, uh, and also, they don't fit in most people's shoes. Opinions uh, that I have might not match what you've experienced and what you've gone through in your life. And because of that, um, I don't want to give you my opinion because my opinion doesn't necessarily matter. It's it's not something that can give you uh, um, universal and immutable and transformational truth and hope like God's word can. Let's look there at God's word to examine some things that I believe can help us and encourage us and give us some hope. And uh, that, that that's what my goal is today. My goal, my aim is to encourage us and to, to allow us to see that in God's word we can find um, some things that can help the situations that we're going through as a country, as individuals, as uh, people groups. And uh, there is, the first thing I, I want to point out is that there is no such thing as race according to the Bible. There's no such thing as race according to the Bible. How can there be, um, when according to the Bible, we are all descended from two people twice, right? We were descendants from Adam and Eve. And then also, we're all descendants from Noah and Mrs. Noah, okay? Twice, we are all descendants. How can, how can race be something when there are two descendants or, or you know, two people that we can draw our descendant, our, our ancestry back to? And um, flip over, I told you to flip to Genesis chapter 1. Look at verse number 26 and 27 there. It says, and God said, let us make man in our image. And after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. It doesn't say let us make men. Man. There's one race. It's mankind. And there is no uh, multiple races. There is no none, none of that uh, difference there can be found in Scripture. There's no div division that can be found there. And um, there's one race, there's one kind. And even science in many ways agrees with that thinking. And that race is a social and cultural construct that has no basis in biology. And and if you'd like to learn more about that and, and like to uh, learn some science about the things behind that, then get on Answers, the, the website of Answers in Genesis. And they have a free online book called One Race, One Blood. And they could probably explain it to you a lot better than I could. But we can just see from Scripture here pretty definitively that there is only one race. And we see that even in the Romans road. Flip over to Romans chapter number 10. 
Okay, Romans chapter number 10. And I, I didn't mark any of these in my Bible to give you time to turn there too. So if you don't have a Bible, uh, pause this and go grab one. That way you can flip and see these things for yourself. I think there, you can find more hope when you see it for yourself than just me pointing it out to you. So Romans chapter number 10. And, um, and we're going to look at there what that has to say about race. And in verse number 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. There's no difference. That, that we see a difference, but God doesn't. We see um, uh, differences and, 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 and changes in things, but, but God does not. And then in verse number 13, maybe one of the greatest verses in all of scripture. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That God does not treat anyone differently because they are all the same in his eyes. There is only one race according to the Bible. God declares that there's no difference in his eyes amongst mankind. Do we need anything more clear and obvious? Anyone who thinks um, that, 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 uh, that, that this is something that cannot be definitively shown in Scripture, uh, I, I don't know what they're thinking. That there, there's only one race according to the Scripture. I'm just pointing. I'm not saying this. I'm just pointing to, out to Scripture that says this. Uh, one more place. Flip back to Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17 and verse number 24 here. The Apostle Paul is um, dealing with some people in Athens. And and um, and Athens was a place where uh, it was kind of the cultural center of Greece at the time. And a lot of different ideas were thrown around there. Different people groups were in that area. And uh, verse number 24 says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, um, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all things, or giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That we are all one blood there, according to Scripture. There is no such thing as race, according to to scripture. We cannot find the division of race in scripture. We can only find it in the narrative and the doctrine of this world. And the, the, the theory of race and, and that, that all stems from an idea of evolution really is where that stems from. And um, I, I don't think I need to go into how that comes from that, but man, evolution is a big factor in behind the divisions that we see in race today. They, they went, came to the forefront and there's always been racism throughout uh, the history of mankind. And, um, and, 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 but I think it came to the forefront even more when evolution uh, came to the forefront. So the first thing I see is that the, that there is no such thing as race according to scripture. The second thing I see is that the church should be a unified body of Christ. It should be a unified body of Christ, not divided by class or culture or color. Flip over second Corinthians. Second Corinthians chapter number 12. Chapter number 12. Second Corinthians 12. We're going to start reading in verse number 12 there. And uh, I'm giving you plenty of time to flip there because I am uh, having a hard time flipping there myself. So it says, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you, in all patience and signs and wonders. I think I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 12 because that is not where I want to be. Oh, there it is. First so Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 12 says, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So he's saying there that and we as a church should be um, united. And, and, and although there are members, they're all one body. And verse number 13, For by one spirit we are all baptized in a one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it pleaseth him. Or excuse me, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again of the... Of the, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble 
are necessary. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having, having given more abundant honor to that part with la which lacketh, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, that the church should be united, that there should be no division of, of class, culture, or color, that there should be um, no schism in the body, that we should be united around Christ and, and united around these things and that color and race and, and all of those things should not matter to us and that we should have all the same care one for another. And whether one member, verse number 26, suffer, all the members suffer with it or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. The man, when we see another member hurting, we should help that member. When we see another uh, member in pain, we should try to comfort uh, that member. Um, and maybe many of you, like me, have have uh, rolled your ankle at some point in your life, and and uh, when you roll your ankle, what is your uh, uh, right away your reaction to do? You don't even think about it. You start to limp, right? And you can tell that in your entire walk that you are limping. Why? Because the rest of your body is trying to help out that member that is hurting. Can I tell you that the church should also be noticeably trying to help out those who are hurting and those who are going through difficult times. And racism is a sin. And it should not exist in any church that is under the banner of, of Christ and, and, and believes in the uh, doctrine of Scripture but yet, like any other sin, it does. It does exist in the church. And, and where there is people, there is sin. And when we recognize our sin of not treating everyone as the body of Christ and not um, helping out a member uh, when they are hurting and not, not uh, honoring a member when they should be honored, but when we notice that, we, sh we have to repent of that. We have to change uh, from that. But also, when we recognize that a member uh, oh, bodies in pain or we, we, or is in need, we must do something for them. Not just repent of what we've done, but also change and, and do something different. Why? Because we're all one body. That's why I'm making this video. I, I, that's why I, I felt, um, such a burden to make it. Man, I, I was talking to my wife about it yesterday about how much, um, and I felt like this ho hopefully will be an encouragement and help to our teenagers and, and because I know many of you are hurting. And we're in a time where we're separated a little more than usual. So I felt like I must encourage you in every way that I could and should. And, and if there's more I can do for you, please reach out to me. If there's something I can help you with, and I want to be a help and a blessing to you. And I hope that, that this is a little bit of that. The next thing I think to see is, and this is going to be a little longer video than usual. And I hope you bear with me with that. But the true value of your life is only found in scripture. The true value of your life, teenager, is only found in scripture. Your value does not come from how much uh, melanin you have or what, in other words, what your skin color is or, or what neighborhood you live in or what school you go to or what church you attend or what political party you claim. It comes from what someone is willing to pay for it. My car is worth more to me than what it's blue booked for. I think uh, the car that I drive is blue booked at maybe around $2,000 if I had to take a guess. And if you offer me $2,000 a day for my car, I would not give it to you. Why? Because I, I couldn't replace that car for $2,000 to me because it's a good running car. And uh, there's risks involved. It has high mileage. It's very old. It's older than any teenager in my youth group. But yet it, it's my car and it, it has a lot more value to me than it does to someone else. And, and and so the value of it is higher than necessarily what it is because what I'm willing to pay for it and, or excuse me, keep it for. Uh, the other thing is uh, that I, I think is important to notice is that the most expensive painting in the world to me is not worth what it's sold for. Um, millions upon, I think it was, oh, man, I, don't quote me on this, but I think it was about $400 million was, a, was the most expensive painting in the world, somewhere in that range. And there's no way that I would ever pay, even if I had it, that much for a painting. Why? Because it's not worth that to me. But to somebody, it's worth that much. So that's the price. The price of something is only as a uh, value or is only as true as what someone is willing to pay for it. Man, if we took um, something as, as valuable as toilet paper today, right? And we were to throw a price of it of a hundred dollars for a roll. Um, then we would probably figure out that, man, it's not that valuable to us. A hundred dollars is, is the price is not worth it. And we, we wouldn't buy it. And the price of something is based on what someone's willing to pay for it. 
the most your worth is found in what God was willing to pay for your life. Flip over to first Peter chapter number one, first Peter uh, chapter number one. And hopefully I didn't mess up and, and it's actually second Peter. Let's look here. First Peter chapter number one, verse number 17 says, um, for if ye call on the father who without respect of persons judgeth every or judges according to every man's work past the time of your soldiering here in fear. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And so there he says that, man, in the first, verse 18 and 19 predominantly, he's saying that, man, you were bought with God's precious blood. Not with corruptible things like silver and gold. It, it's, Peter's pretty well saying, not with worthless stuff. Not stuff that wastes away and isn't really worth much. Silver and gold. You know, something that we think that we value of, of high uh, esteem and high value for those things. But yet, the Apostle Peter said, hey, that's not something that you were bought with, those, that cheap stuff. No, you were bought with the precious blood of Christ, teenager. That your value is not dependent on what the color of your skin is or what neighborhood or what school you go to. It's not dependent on anything. It depends on what God was willing to pay for it. And he gave his very own precious blood. He gave his life for you, teenager. And so that's where your worth is. Verse number 22. Uh, seeing... You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. So there he's saying, not only understand your worth and see your worth there, but also look and see others worth. See other people's worth. See that everyone's worth is the same to God and that that worth is beyond all measure. It's beyond all measure that there is not a soul on this planet that is worth less to God. And because of that, we should not love any soul on this planet any less than any other. Not because of what uh, color of their skin, not because of where they live, not because of how much money they have in their bank account. No, because what God was willing to pay for that person, teenager. And that was with his life. That was with his precious blood. The last thing I, I, I have for you today is that one day this will end. One day, things like this will end. Racism is a sin. I said I said it earlier, and and, um, and and but yet sin will not reign forever. Sin will be around for as long as people are around, but sin will not reign forever because one day Jesus is going to come back and He is going to uh, get rid of sin and the devil. And um, in Revelation chapter five, verse number nine tells us, and they sung a new song saying, "Thou art worthy to take the body and to open the seals thereof." For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And that there will come a day, teenager, where we will stand before the throne of God praising with people who we may not have seen in our church pews and people who may not have uh, talked the same language as us or people who may not have lived next door to us or people who don't uh, look like us or worship like us or dress like us. And we're all going to be standing before the throne of God praising him and declaring him and there will be no schism in the body of Christ there will be no um, looking at people in the wrong way and having uh, prejudices and and prejudgments about people and none of that will happen because sin will reign no more it will one day end I don't know how to solve the problem today but I can tell you that there is coming a day where that problem will be solved may we find hope in the pages of scripture that transcends any of our experiences or opinions. I can't give you an experience that can help you. And my opinion is not going to help you. But I hope that God's word was a help to you, teenager. I love you. I look forward to a, just a couple of weeks us being able to have a teen service once again. And, and um, if there's anything I can help you with, please let me know. And um, I, I look forward so much to seeing you once again and love you.